Hello and a very warm welcome to this discussion on what levelling up really means and how you might actually do it, how to turn a promise into reality. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the director of the Institute. Well, I'm delighted to be bringing together this discussion, one we talk about a lot in the Institute. It's the second we're holding on this particular subject with legal in general. We held one on Friday on the health component of levelling up, but in this one, if you like, we go straight for the core question. That is, what does it mean and how might you do it? Since the 2019 general election, we've heard a lot about it. This is the government's go to slogan, if you like. The Queen's speech set out the government's ambition to level up opportunities across all parts of the UK. We'll not come back to that word opportunities as opposed to results. The Chancellor has previously unveiled a levelling up fund. The Prime Minister has recently appointed a levelling up advisor and the promise to level up featured heavily during the recent Hartlepool by-election. But we know less, perhaps, uh, about what it actually means and how the government intends to turn this slogan into reality. And the point we will definitely touch on, it is not the first time a government has tried to do this. How might voters also judge the success or failure at the next election? Well, I've got a really terrific panel here to discuss all this. Can't think of a better one. Peter Mandelson, Lord Mandelson, Chairman of Global Council, among many, many things that qualify him to talk about this. He was former European Commissioner for Trade and MP for Hartlepool from 1992 to 2004. Peter, welcome. We've also got Rachel Wolfe, founding partner at Public First, former ed education and innovation advisor to Prime Minister David Cameron. We have John Godfrey, corporate affairs director at Legal and General, who was head of policy at number 10 from 2016 to 2017. And Giles Wilkes, who's our very own senior fellow, who's former special advisor to Theresa May, who writes on this among a cluster of special subjects. So great to have you all with us. Let's kick straight off. And Peter, I wonder if I can start with you. What does levelling up mean to you and what would you do about it? Well, thanks, Bronwyn. What it means to me is 30 percent of seats in England and Wales, uh, which are in need of levelling up you know, in respect of their uh, low employment, welfare dependency, poor health, educational attainment, empty business premises and shops. And 68 percent of those constituencies are in the north. Uh, and the Midlands, 17 of the 20 most in need of levelling up are, are in the north, including my own former constituency of Hartlepool, with the remaining three being in the Midlands. And I think the point we need to make, first of all, is that there is a history uh, to all this. The challenge is certainly not new. Uh, in 1961, Macmillan sent Lord Helsham to sort out the North East, if you remember. Uh, it was a priority for Wilson's department, newly created Department of Economic Affairs. Heath's solution was to take us into the European community. Thatcher's answer was Japanese inward investment. Major had Heseltine. Blair and Brown created regional development agencies, local enterprise zones. They rebuilt schools and hospitals and champions. Social inclusion and were tough on crime and the causes of crime the great heyday of uh, new Labour. Uh, and then along came Cameron and Osborne, wreaked havoc in all these uh, places and policies through austerity, tried to make up for it with Leps and the Northern Powerhouse. Theresa May had Greg Clark's excellent industrial strategy, better than uh, mine. And now that brings us to Boris Johnson, uh, whose uh, answer is so far, uh, pots of money, a sort of jam spreading approach, handouts from Whitehall rather than longer term uh, strategies uh, without empowering uh, those places which he is saying he wants to level up. So a lot of short term, if desirable, smartening up of places. Now, the point that all this history shows us, in my view, Bronwyn, is that there are underlying economic forces which are not in the gift of government simply to wave a wand and change. So the question now is whether there are emerging economic uh, forces, modifications to globalization and global supply chains and emerging uh, technologies that might temper some of the intensive centralizing globalizing trends of the last four decades. 
and bring new markets and supply changes nearer to home, uh, for example, through the energy transition and decarbonisation. Now, in saying it wants to think afresh, in my view, the government has made a good start uh, with appointing Neil O'Brien, uh, because he has both intelligence uh, and institutional memory. But let me just make three quick points in conclusion in these remarks. First, if the Treasury does not buy into anything that uh, Neil O'Brien and his white paper brings forward, any such white paper uh, will simply be dead on arrival. So best to link it to the spending review, take a bit more time, uh, link it to the agreed priorities in the autumn. Second, there has to be a philosophical shift uh, from pork barrel to co-creation, you know, based on local knowledge uh, and skill. Otherwise, the serious structural uh, barriers to change won't be identified and they won't be addressed. Uh, we won't get the public investment that we need to lever in private enterprise to help create a new uh, modern business spine for those towns and communities who have lost what existed before. And thirdly, there has to be longevity of policy. You know, enough of this sort of stop, go, tabula rasa, anything anyone did before has got to go, we're going to rethink it all again. If there's no longevity, there will be no change and there will be no levelling up. All right, thank you very much for Kate. There's lots of points I could come back to immediately on, but I won't. Let me go straight to Rachel. Rachel, what do you make of it? So I think that, I mean, the whole reason for this event, and as Peter um, has sort of highlighted, is levelling up is not a very useful slogan. It's not very useful in political terms. It doesn't land particularly well, uh, either with voters in the North or, or probably voters in the South. But it also does obfuscate lots of different policy aims. And, and I wanted to go through those a little bit because, um, to me, one of the core tests of this aim, let's call it levelling up, is to be able to demonstrate to voters who very clearly voted for change in two subsequent ways, first with Brexit and then in 2019, that those votes will be honoured and justified in some way. And I think you therefore have to split between some shorter term and longer term aims. And the shorter term aims are substantively more easy and obvious in terms of how to achieve them. So I'll just go through a few of them uh, and then come to the longer term ones. We do a lot of focus groups with people in these areas. So I'm going to start with what they say, uh, which is, again, as Peter sort of highlighted, they feel that the place they live in is getting slightly more depressing every year. Shops are closing. There is graffiti on the cenotaph. It feels mildly unsafe. There's not as much to do as there used to be. They often miss things that used to exist in the past, monthly markets, for example, that come up again and again. And I think it is true that the civic infrastructure in a lot of these places has become uh, depressed or at least has not had the opportunity to thrive as much as it could. So there is unquestionably a place, what does it feel like to live in a place angle to what people feel frustrated by? And I think you have to address that. Um, and some of that is about what those places look like and feel like. Some of it is about what is in there. Um, and some of it is about what there is um, to do and how safe it is. I think the second thing which comes back to opportunity is what it is what it is that people can um, achieve in those places. And I would say the most significant, and I should declare an interest that I'm related to one of the people writing the policy, but the most significant policy announcement in the last six months uh, from this administration is the attempt to completely rewrite the adult skills system so that people genuinely have a chance to retrain through their lives and have a chance to pursue local training opportunities wherever they are, rather than this sense that you get again and again, that people have to leave not only for jobs, but even to train for those jobs. So I think there are opportunity gains, and those both give you some tangible demonstration that you are on a path to achieving that longer term levelling up aim, which is, I suspect, what John and Giles will, will talk about. The, the reason that I kind of stress that and, and think it's important to divorce the two is because if you don't, you do end up in a situation where you think that to, ge to generate long-term economic productivity gains, you end up sprinkling money over tax. 
which makes no sense. What you need to do, obviously, for longer term productivity gains is, again, I suspect exactly what Giles and John are going to talk about, which is long term investment in R&D infrastructure, industrial clusters, including around net zero, um, as Peter mentioned. But you're not going to have a hope of showing real tangible progress against those within a parliamentary term. And if you show no tangible progress against anything within a parliamentary term, it is unreasonable to expect people to vote for you and your agenda again. So I think we have to split between these two, not because one is more or less important than the other, but because you have to think of them differently in achievement terms. Really helpful. Again, thanks very much. John, let me come uh, straight on to you. Mm, yes, thanks. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and give you a little bit of an investor's perspective as opposed to a political perspective. And, um, you know, at, at LNG, we started investing in UK cities and towns seven or eight years ago. And, and the, the driver for doing that was we thought clearly it's beneficial to us and our customers if the UK economy performs better. The way to increase productivity is to go to those places where productivity is lower. So in other words, outside London. The second part of it is that if you go to those places to invest, you frankly get more for your money. And uh, it was uh, strategically better for us to create new assets in cities outside London than to buy trophy assets that had gone through five or 10 different owners at ever inflating prices. And we've, we've now invested uh, just over 30 billion pounds uh, as part of that program. And the intention is to do another 30 billion pounds. What have we been investing in? Uh, it's uh, in terms of cities, it, it ranges from Newcastle to Sunderland to Leeds to Manchester to Bristol to Oxford. Uh, to Edinburgh, Glasgow uh, and Cardiff uh, and others besides. Birmingham is, is a major investment for us too. So these are all cities and they tend to have characteristics in common, which is there's a sort of economic agglomeration because of the place. Uh, there is often a top quality university to invest alongside and we have partnerships with Newcastle and uh, most recently with Manchester which is a one and a half billion pound investment to create a, an, uh, an innovation district. Uh, and, and you obviously have a population that therefore is, is well qualified. And if they can stay there and you can house them appropriately, create the right environment for them, you will see uh, an economic effect. We, we, want, we want to do another 30 billion and it's going to become a bit more difficult because you have to work down the size scale from these big cities uh, to smaller places and uh, those are less obviously investable on their own terms and you require more work with government. The, the other point uh, I think that I would mention is that this is long term investment. You know, it does go beyond a parliamentary term. Most of this is 30 or 40 year investment because this is paying people's pensions. Uh, so we do take a very, uh, a very long view uh, of, of what we're doing there. And finally, um, what does levelling up mean in different places? The answer is it means different things. The most successful investments we have made and the ones that have really worked have been working in partnership, in collaboration with local government to deliver a vision that they have developed. It doesn't come top down. It's different in Media City and Salford uh, to what it is in Oxford, where the requirements uh, are much more about affordable housing. Again, it's different in, in Bristol, it's different in Sunderland. So you have to give, I think, more uh, leeway and more uh, power to local governments to do this. City mayors are a terrific innovation. Regardless of their politics, they all want the right outcomes for their cities and districts, whether it's Andy Street, Andy Burnham, Ben Houchen, you know, Marvin Rees in Bristol, whoever it may be. And these are the guys who can really help drive this program forward rather than Whitehall or, dare I say, at Westminster. John, thanks very much indeed. Um, I might come back to you on that, on, on that challenge to government uh, um, a bit down the line, because, of course, you were part of um, one of Theresa May's advisors when she was indeed talking about left behind uh, people and um, just about managing and so on. Uh, but Giles, let me come on to you. You, you write a lot about this. Uh, you write a lot about what doesn't work as well as what might work, what's your take on it, what it means, what you can do? 
Uh, thank you very much, Bronwyn. It's always uh, difficult to go after such excellent speakers. You find yourself crossing off the points that you were hoping to make as they go through making them. For example, Lord Mandelson raised that this was an old issue. I have a prop I like to use, a book from 1967 about the regional productivity problem. He beat me by six years there. So I won't make that point. It's a very old issue. And uh, regional productivity has been a problem for the UK since the ebbing of the industrial peak in the 20s or 30s. We've had um, real issues with this. And frankly, we haven't always had an answer to it. But first of all, you asked me, Bronwyn, what does this mean? Um, I think there's a cynical version and a, a, a naive version that we should believe to try and give support to this agenda. The cynical version is we've always had these regional issues and conservatives have always realised it's popular as a government to say we're going to fix things for you but it's, it's normally the left that says the government is going to fix your problems and conservatives have been more uh, associated with that infamous phrase of Norman Tebbit get on your bike if you don't like where your place is then go to somewhere where the place is prosperous they found a way of, of, um, of saying we're going to help you as the government that seems to chime with conservative principles Leveling up has a great feeling to it. It sounds like we're going to get you back to the area you should be. We're going to let you seize your own opportunities. And they're making the most of it. And what I hope is um, they're going to stick to it. Um, uh, the other the other cynical interpretation is they know it's really, really difficult. But what matters is to say, have a lot of bigger announcements, lots of big billions of pounds spending. And frankly, because you can't really tell the result for a long time, what you need to be doing is sending big signals saying we're on your side, voters. And I think it's been a fantastic slogan for that reason, too. And it's going to keep being um, used. There's going to be an excellent IFG pamphlet out soon analysing all the different ways it's being used in words, in all sorts of policies. In fact, it's most associated, if I'm allowed to leak one of the top results, with connectivity, with the sense that some regions are just not as connected to others, which is another important economic point. But in terms of what, I mean, Rachel wrote a wonderful blog recently, which she was too modest to mention, but you should all go and read it on Conservative Homes, saying it's not about fixing regional productivity, and then turned up here expecting me to say, yes, it is. And I'm going to pretend I do think it's about fixing regional productivity. And number one, I think that is really, really hard. That's the thing that these um, 50 year old books are, have been written about and have largely failed. And it's not all about investment. I mean, I think it's great to hear that John's saying that LNG finds a natural reason for money to go to these regions. But if there was a natural reason, if it was always the case that cheaper things are better to invest in, cheaper things would always be getting more expensive and things would be naturally sorting themselves out. It's conservatives that normally point these things out, that you actually need the state to change the playing field. And what should the state be doing is what the levelling up um, debate is all about. Um, just to, to invoke some of that scepticism that Bronwyn was expecting of me, we, there are two things that the Johnson administration seems to think are kind of magic. One is investment. Oh, that's that's the thing telling me to stop speaking, but I'm going to shut up, just to dismiss, sorry. Um, uh, one is investment, which is lots of spending on infrastructure and transport, but we are doing that. It takes a very long time for that to make a difference, and sometimes infrastructure is just a way of placing people getting out of places quickly. The other one that they think is even more powerful is R&D spending. And this is the idea that if you try to situate your brainy industries outside of these regions um, that normally benefit from it, the southeast and so on, then you will be able to generate new clusters that will um, become the Seattle's and Boston's of the future. All I can say about this is it's extremely difficult. The agglomeration benefits of being around where the existing clever people are is are incredibly powerful. And there have been there's a long list, perhaps a hundred long on Wikipedia of places that decided to call themselves Silicon something or other and failed because there's only one Silicon Valley. There's a lot of places that become little clusters of knowledge, but they tended to have started around 1300 to 1500. So it's a really challenging agenda, but the government is doing so well with it that I'm convinced they're going to stick in it. Charles, thanks very much indeed. Thank you for having a thing that tells you when to stop speaking. Um, I'm very happy to take on that role and not to have exercised it. OK, I want to pick up two points that have come up already. One is um, about regional productivity and whether it's about that. And then there's the other one, which is, is you know, is is in um, all of what you what you all have said in different ways, which is how much is this actually a job for government? And um, and and John, you know, threw down a challenge to say it's not really about central government. Uh, it is a lot to do with cities, to do with local government, and and so on. Peter, what what's what, what are your thoughts hearing this on the on these two points? Well, my uh, my view, Bronwyn, is that poor regions are poor 
uh, not because they have large numbers of poor people, but because they have smaller numbers of high income people and large growing and profitable businesses. I mean, there are many um, poor people in London and the southeast. Um, but what they also have, you know, is high income people and talented people and a lot of existing and potential business growth. I mean, money attracts money, capital attracts capital, scale att attracts scale, which is why incidentally cities have turned around uh, uh, so much and towns uh, haven't. I mean, the root cause of local poverty is the loss in many towns uh, and uh, communities of their fundamental economic reason for existing. I mean, the disappearance of coal or steel or fish or mass production or tourism. I mean, that was the story of my constituency uh, in, uh, in Hartlepool. Hartlepool, you know, used to be one of the, had the highest uh, per capita wealth in the northern region in the early part of the last century. Why? Uh, because its port and shipping provided the main international outlet uh, for the Durham coal field. It was a this was a huge engine of prosperity, of fine house building, services, rail, and other infrastructure, all in and around Hartlepool. Now, the, the point I'm making is that you know we have got to uh, replace those you know reasons for those economic reasons for existence with um, a, a fresh reason for e a fresh economic reason for existing. I mean, with a new, basically a new private enterprise and business spine that's going to generate uh, the uh, employment opportunities and start and create a sort of spiral that goes upwards rather than downwards. And I do think that we have an opportunity uh, because we do have an excellent science and technology base in this country. Uh, we have workforce skills in which we need to invest far more, as Rachel has said, and I wouldn't simply refer there to adult skills. I would talk about the provision we need to make for the 50% of the sort of cohort that doesn't go to university. Don't roll back the universities, by the way, as some in the Conservative Party are, are thinking of, of doing. In a complementary way, make, make new uh, provision alongside the universities in a variety of different sorts of ways for those who don't want to go to university. But the point is that we have an opportunity to build out from uh, the you know, digital AI decarbonizing energy transitions that are taking place um, to identify the business and commercial opportunities linked to them and to focus government support, not on sectors, but on whole supply chains so that innovation and production and employment coheres in more places across the country than simply London and the southeast. Therefore, the regional dimension is very, very important indeed. And be willing to take some risks in doing this and act at scale, uh, you know, rather than, um, you know, just pursuing this sort of plethora, widening plethora of pots of money and new initiatives or whatever. Regional uh, productivity, regional investment, public investment, levering in private capital. These are the important things to do, but you cannot separate, in my view, your innovation strategy, your industrial policies uh, from your levelling up. They, they are two sides uh, of uh, 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 the same uh, uh, coin. So yes, of course, you need a better educated uh, labour force. It's a very important driver of local economic performance. But unless the local economy is replaced with that new modern business spine that I talk about, other efforts are likely to be simply cosmetic uh, or uh, 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 short uh, uh, lived. And the other thing we have to do is to uh, empower uh, 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 these places. I mean, we, 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 really, do, we really do need to take the example uh, of Burnham in Manchester and Houchen in, in Teesside and look at how empowering local, strong political leaders uh, helps in this whole process.
Thanks very much for that. Let me just weave in a question. Um, and you're referring to, to, to Hartlepool, the dis disappearance of uh, old industries. Uh, a question from Ian Ray, who says, if it's all so difficult, it's a challenge, the tone of this conversation so far, the, the question came before you started speaking, Peter. Um, if it's all so difficult, how is it that, say, Warrington, a northern coal mining and, and um, wire making town, now has one of the, the fastest long term gross value added per capita growth rates in the UK? Um, Ra Rachel, what's your thought on this? Uh I'll go to the first question you asked first and then we can come to the second one. I, I mean, I'll try and be brief and just to try and pull together what I was saying. You know, is regional productivity a massive challenge that deserves government attention? Yes. And does it make sense for the sort of core things that they're already pushing, which are broadly increased R&D investment, trying to gear that towards more private sector investment, hopefully some substantive infrastructure investment in the north, um, skills investment. Does it make sense to try and gear those things alongside their major sectoral investments, which are mostly around net zero and probably going to increasingly be, um, towards trying to address that gap? Yes, it does. Will you see any results of that in a sort of parliamentary time frame? I think it is doubtful. Um, and is it sufficient to say to the people in the towns of England that this stuff might come down the track one day if it works? No, in my view, which is why I think, I mean, I'm not sure I, I would, I'm not sure this is what Peter was saying, but I wouldn't consider things like uh, safety to be entirely cosmetic. I think they're core to people's um, security and satisfaction in life. And, and I think some cosmetic things really matter. You know, I have lived my last year off the Victorian parts of England and I'm very grateful to them, cosmetic or not. Um, so, so I suppose what I am saying is, you cannot simply make this, or not simply, heroic efforts in terms of regional productivity where we are not completely confident about what will work, but there are substantive things to be tried and say that that is enough. I don't think it is enough. Thanks for that. John, I want to come to you and you know, put to you the point that I put in passing earlier, um, that the, the answer you gave in a very uh, a fascinating one about legal and generals um, investments and indeed the perspective of an investor um, challenged what um, the, the kind of perspective of, of people that perhaps in your former kind of job at the heart of government who are trying to do it from there. Which do you think matters most? Um, well, I, I think I think both matter and and it it depends again very much on the place you're you're looking at and what it is you're trying to do. Um, I mean, I give you two examples and a challenge, I think, uh, by, by way of an answer to to or by way of a comment on the discussion we've had so far. I mean, the, fir the first example really is Salford, which was the first place we, we invested heavily into. Great local vision driven by a Labour mayor called Ian Stewart. Um, it resulted in, in Media City and the employment of more people in, in digital media there than had ever worked there as dockers when Salford was the biggest port, uh, I think, at that time in the world at the end of the Manchester uh, Ship Canal. Uh, and that's it's going very well. Um, the second example is picks up the point about R and D in universities. We we have sort of by hook or by crook some of the best universities in the world. We massively outpunch our weight in 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 academic and research uh, uh, activities. And you know we've tried to uh, with our investments uh, leverage off that. So Alderley Park, which is a, a, a campus we, we own, um, now has uh, not just life science research going on and played a, a role in the, the whole COVID um, uh, uh, handling, but it also has about 200 startups there uh, in, in that sector. So you can make these things happen reasonably quickly if you provide the right facilities for them to happen. You combine the place and the education and the people. Now, none, none of that was, uh, was was subsidized, although government does obviously invest as a, as a, as a purchaser of some of the output. Um, the challenge, I think, goes back to this point about things being different in, in different places. And just to, to, to make it sort of concrete, if we think about HS2 as a, as a grand projet, uh, cost now about £100 billion. Pounds. Um, Andy Street, Andy Burnham, others, very supportive of it um, because it's a Either you support it or you don't if they're in their position. If the government were to say, for example, let's take that hundred billion pound cost of HS2 and divide it, say, three ways between 
Burnham, Street and Houchen, what would they choose to spend that money on? Would it be better intracity connectivity? Would it be Not better east-west connectivity? Would you get something that had greater economic leverage than the railway line we're building? I, I pose it not as a challenge, Peter, but just as an open question. It's terrible. HS2 is one of the biggest public policy abominations of the last decade. I, I, I'm appalled. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it is basically what HS2 is going to do is, is act as a funnel of business, investment, opportunity, growth. You'll pour it in in the north and it will come down to London and the southeast. It won't go the other way. Giles. Um, th lots of really interesting points there. I mean, this really interesting implicit question, should we be handing powers downwards to people at a local level to make decisions and therefore implicitly to also to risk failing? Because that's what that's the big implicit one that I don't see being confronted by the government for reasons a it's a really difficult one because um ha handing out powers and money means that the places that fail can often get into a really bad state we have a more devolved system in the united states for example and as a result you have disasters like the way detroit fell fell behind 15 20 years ago it takes a lot of courage to allow things like that to happen and a really federal mindset in the case of the united states but the other reason is that it often means for this government handing powers to uh, political opponents. So you'd be hand it, handing it over to a lot of local Labour mayors and so forth. And um, and also there's not very much evidence, particularly if you do listen to the Treasury, that when people out there get to decide which industry should be local, which one should be supporting, that you don't get more of that pork barrel stuff that um, Lord Mandelson was worrying about. Um, what we had when we inherited the RDAs from the um, previous government, and by the way, from what I, from the Lord Mandelson's officials that I got to work with, the RDAs were a really good thing. They were, they needed to be improved in lots of ways, but they shouldn't have been abolished. But they did say they were all the fine for their own. Yes, yeah, sorry, I should have made that clear. The regional development agencies that would have been called right now the levelling up agencies if they were recreated, and. They all were trying to pursue the same technological goals. Some of them were, all of them had their own nanotech centers going on at the same time. So they were regarded as inefficient, but that's what happens when you devolve power. So I think there's a really key question there. What, a final one I'd make about skills. It's really interesting to hear Rachel, who, who really understands how this government thinks, talk about how uh, important the skills agenda is here as well. But one of the problems we have with regional productivity is when people become more productive, they then try to go to improve their, their livelihoods wherever they can go. One of the excellent members of the Industrial Strategy Council, now sadly abolished, made this point that she came from this particular benighted part of the UK and she's a highly skilled person and that's why she's now in London. And that's an incredibly difficult instinct to fight against and I've never heard anyone give a particularly good answer to it. Bronwyn, yeah. can I pick up two points? Yes. First of all, on the, RD, on the RDAs. Um, ridiculous vandalism to do away with the RDAs. They should have been reformed, developed and adapted to what the government is, governments have been trying to do uh, since. Government needs that sort of executive sort of instrument, that means of sort of delivering real resource, real public investment mm. uh, and coordination on the ground. Secondly, to pick up John Godfrey's point about universities, I am absolutely convinced that Britain's future prosperity will be built on the shoulders of our universities, not just our research intensive universities, although they'll play uh, the greater role, but all of them. And, and my priority for uh, central government would be to would be change in the higher education sector in, in future, because I think that research intensive universities need a greater focus on generating societal and economic benefit from their research. We need more US style investment um, management companies attached to our universities so as to generate internal resources to support university operations, grow the underlying capital to support future students and researchers and commercialize uh, research conducted on campus. 
Uh, I also think we we need to ag agree with the universities, you know, how they're going to specialise in what aspects of STEM research and teaching, you know, to force a bit of consolidation uh, and clustering. Uh, and this, as I said, should go hand in hand uh, with reprioritising the government's funding to uh, further education uh, as part of a, a, a broader growth uh, uh, strategy. But if universities and skills uh, are going to be so important, then universities need reform. And secondly, uh, we need to diversify oftentimes the routes into those universities from a skilled system which is rooted in a much bigger, more refreshed uh, further education sector. Yeah, which, which Rachel was talking about earlier. Let's go to the questions. There's really a lot of terrific questions, and I think we can keep exploring these points as we go along. Please do keep sending the questions. I don't mean put off by that. Let me start um, an interesting one from Adrian Thacker saying, in an increasingly interconnected world, what, what will regions actually mean in, in 20 years? Um, they mean anything, or will it be north versus south, or towns versus cities? Rachel. I mean, my general experience is identities are quite stubborn and we spent a long time wondering if the nation was disappearing and across the world we've been firmly rem reminded that the nation is in no way disappearing. Um, so I would be a little surprised if the identity of places that is millennia old in many cases um, uh, suddenly disappeared. Some regions are more natural than others and some places are more natural than others and you've seen attempts to create regions which largely fall apart in terms of people's identity and in terms of economic geography. So, so I think in identity terms, regions are here to stay. In economic terms, um, I guess we have sort of constantly danced between smaller places, towns, cities and region economies. Um, and I think uh, one, I think, of the questions that the government needs to answer is if they go for the city agglomeration investment approach that I think in part someone like John has been espousing is where a lot of the great universities are. What sort of spillover can one expect and how can one enhance that spillover so that if you're living in a town that feels a bit rubbish and grotty and you know you're even already in quite easy commuting distance because there are plenty of towns like that there is perfectly easy to commute into a city centre. How do you make sure that the wealth and opportunity spreads and how much do you care? Um, I think that's the sort of inter-region question, because of course regions are themselves incredibly diverse in terms of their productivity, um, opportunity and skills level um, that we need to answer. But I'm, I feel fairly confident to predict that in 50 years people will still be okay. talking about where they're from. Regions will still be there. Do either of the, any of the three of you uh, want to jump in on that? But in the in the interest of getting in a lot of questions, I'm otherwise going to right, kind of briefly. throw, so just throw the... each, each question primarily at one person. Go on. Just a, a very quick point, Bronwyn, on that, and it goes back to something Peter said earlier, which was about the importance of supply chains. I mean, if you if you can uh, not only create new industries, but create the supply chains that feed them, that can have a, a useful regional uh, impact and into smaller towns as well. And I'm thinking this might be part of the solution you know, for uh, the Northeast, for his former constituency and that part of the world. Uh, if that uh, area can pick up the supply issues for the next phase of North Sea development, which is about renewables and wind, rather than having the, 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 the kit built somewhere overseas and shipped in. No, good point. Thank you. My, right, my, my postscript to that, Roman, would be that you need, therefore, a vital role and responsibility of the private sector of business in the regions. It's not good enough, I'm afraid, for a mayor uh, simply to have a few business mates with whom to do business, uh, that mayor has to really think in a much broader holistic way about the business uh, uh, sector, private sector as a whole, uh, and not simply channel things through his mates. And Bronwyn, I know you want to move on, but this does matter for institutions too. I mean, universities are very nationally and globally oriented in terms of their incentives, and generally we have relatively weak localized institutions compared to other countries, partly because we're a very centralized nation. If you're serious about this, you do want to start realigning the incentives of institutions as well as governments so that what they care most about is their local geography. Mm. Mm. 
And, and, and Giles, while, while we're at it, um, you know, is, is the notion of a region going to disappear? I would love somebody on Twitter, I know there's a lot of very clever people, to impose a map of England onto a map of Texas, because I've always been fascinated by this idea. What would the rest of the world think about the fact that we regard these regions as like there's these massive walls between them? And if we don't help the North West and the North East with different policies, they're hopelessly immured in Poverty. Surely, as we do fix connectivity, it will seem ridiculous to most of the world, the idea that if you're over here, you can't benefit from the from the prosperity over there. Now, I agree with Rachel about culture. These places will have individual culture. But particularly with COVID and so much working at home, I do think we need to question the idea that problems are so very, very sticky and that people are so anti-cosmopolitan that they say, well, it's no good things being doing well over there 50 miles away. Why are they not over here? I, I'm surprised that people are quite so sticky. And I think um, it's a really acute question that regions are going to seem as anachronistic as the bomber command areas they were based on in the first place. But there will still be constituency boundaries and seats. And that may be part of the point that we're, yes. uh, we're, we're, we're reaching for. Let me um, let me go to um, another one from Rachel Forbes about uh, asking whether there are international examples of success successful levelling up that the UK government could draw on. John. Um, there, there are, yes. And I, I think of somewhere like Austin, Texas, which uh, used to be, uh, uh, frankly, a place you would avoid uh, 20, 30 years ago, now an absolutely thriving city. If you think of other models that we could um, borrow from, where again, going back to this university and research and commercialization of research model, uh, somewhere like Boston is very interesting um, uh, in the life science space. And this is why we need to create in, in different parts of the UK a better ecosystem for, for venture capital and for startups and scale ups. Uh, there are European uh, examples too, but um, you know, a lot of it is is about, uh, frankly, history being different. And, and so, you know, a, a country like Germany was never quite as centralised with everything in the capital as we have been. Um, yeah. But yes, there are examples we can borrow from. Mm. Now, I mean, the particular, you know, um, factors in each one, Austin obviously has not just the state government, but the vast university, mm. each department of which is about as big as some UK universities. Um, are, are there other thoughts on that um, from your collective experience? I think Detroit's very interesting because it had this radical decline and is now starting to really reinvent and revitalize itself and mostly generated from itself. It's a city, not a region, um, and it's in a region which already has quite amazing uh, places in it. Um, but what they've managed to do in the last decade, I think, is astonishing. Let me just ask you, given you brought up the Detroit example, um, and it was it was. Um, part of its troubles in the past, only part, uh, but was to do with the very local uh, base of American taxation, so that once it lost its tax base, because all kinds of troubles in the inner city and lots of people fled to the suburbs, it then found it very hard to raise money to repair itself. What, what do you think tax planning, how, how should tax planning and, and the ability of local government to raise money come into all this? I think it is really unlikely we are going to move towards serious local tax raising and spending powers. I would be astonished if we did more than a couple of inches in that direction. Powers seem to me more plausible than taxes. Um, partly for this reason, we're not willing to um, cope with some of the inequalities that result. And also because I just, I cannot imagine a treasury ever relinquishing that power or anyone successfully forcing it to. I think Rachel is right there. I would just make the point, though, that one of the reasons there's always often a push for this is there's a there's a feeling that local authorities in the UK are not pro growth. There's no no votes in it for them, and there's no money in it for them. So they reject planning, they reject development. Uh, our planning rules, in particular, are meant to be against this, and this is about to cause a big storm with the government. Um, so the great advantage of devolving this thing is every government out there is a tr is desperate to attract commerce in the states, and that because of the tax sum um, kicker they get from it. And without that, um, you do worry that local um, incentives are simply going to be anti-growth. So I agree with Rachel about the politics of it, but the pressure for it is going to remain, I think. 
OK, thanks very much. Um, there's one from David Phillips on how we measure success within levelling up. And it's something the Cabinet Office is giving quite a lot of thought to at the moment. One of the problems being, we barely mentioned coronavirus in this, but one of the problems being that coronavirus has set back all kinds of metrics in the past year. So your thoughts on how to measure it? And I'll just go on. It's, it's an it's a interesting question. He says, um, there's good evidence. We've seen a fair amount of geographical sorting that explains quite a large fraction of the differences in productivity between areas. Do we want to overturn that existing sorting or, or hold back further sorting? The thrust to the question is how do you measure it? Yeah, go ahead. I was struck by the work that WPI strategy did for the COVID uh, recovery plan that was chaired by John Allen uh, of Tesco's. And if you haven't seen that plan and program, uh, it's very substantial. It has a lot in it and is well worth uh, becoming the subject of, of, of an event uh, like this. And one of the things that they proposed was a uniform set of me uh, metrics covering social as well as economic outcomes that can be used by ministers as well as mayors and local authority leaders, depending on how devolved you want to be, to demonstrate progress in a transparent and easy to understand way. So if you had a levelling up index of the sort that they were envisaging, you know, it would be based on uh, spending power. I mean, the total amount the local population had to spend based on average income levels benefit dependency, uh, an index of multiple deprivation relating to poverty to an education uh, outcomes, to crime rates, picking up uh, Rachel's point about safety, which I do think is very important, health, access to GDP and mortality rates, and in, indeed empty shops data. Now, the point is that I think that, you know, if you, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. You know, uh, you've got to be able to measure outcomes. It, it's the essential uh, discipline and framework uh, that you need. And I can understand why ministers would shy away from such an index, uh, because it would provide a benchmark by which they're going to be judged. But I think if you want to build confidence, mm -hmm. if you really want to take a stick to the different levels of government and institutions that are operating in this area, uh, then you've got to apply uh, matrix over a specific period of time and indeed between elections in order to demonstrate what you're doing well or not, be able to compare your performance with, uh, uh, with others and indeed reward uh, those ministers or mayors and local authority leaders if they're making the progress uh, that they should be. I, I totally, totally agree with that, Bronwyn. And, and um, uh, we, we have a, a, a tool called the Rebuilding Britain Index, which takes uh, into account uh, a lot of polling data. So it's uh, qualitative, but it also takes into account about 50 statistical uh, sources in a mainly ONS. So you have quali uh, quantitative as well. And the idea of that is exactly to figure out uh, if rebuilding Britain and levelling up is happening. So it's a step forward from what investors like ourselves usually do, which is just to look at the uh, the gross value added and, and the GDP effects, because we know that GDP effects aren't quite enough to convince people locally, not all of them, that this is working because GDP is such a, a, a basic and blunt instrument. So absolutely we have to look at all those things including skills education housing and health it is quite wrong if you're talking about leveling up uh, to think that all is well when we have a 20-year gap between different parts of the country on healthy life expectancy for example thanks for that let me go on to one from james calder which follows from that um saying is there evidence that people in areas needing investment actually welcome large numbers of new people and businesses moving into an area um, there may be economic growth, but the character of a town or region may change. Uh, Rachel, you do a lot of... Um, uh, yeah, I, I should say, uh, since Giles mentioned my blog earlier, I did um, I did put down about 20 metrics in that that you could, could use. Um, there comes a point when too many metrics becomes as useless as not enough, but, um, but, but I think it's not hard to come up with them. Um, do people want large amounts of investment and large numbers of businesses? They want jobs. They want good jobs and they know that businesses are the way in which one gets 
good jobs. They don't want overwhelming numbers of people, particularly if they think that the public sector infrastructure uh, won't follow. Um, so I think it is a it is a legitimate question, and I don't think most people in towns want those towns to become big cities. Um, but I don't I think that business investments with jobs is is well. Thanks for that. Um, I've got another question, uh, no name attached, but pushing on this question of, of examples from other countries um, and saying, what can we learn from the experience of East Germany? Um, and others have added to that Northern Ireland. Does anyone have particular thoughts on these two places? I mean, uh, just just a couple of um, slight, slightly, um, slightly negative ones. There's such unique circumstances that it's very, very hard to apply by that kind of a, a model elsewhere. I mean, within the case of East Germany, the the figure dinging around in my head is something like a trillion euros or something of investment. Uh, and another really interesting um, fact about economic development, the solidarity needed to do massive transfers. It's a lot easier when you feel that you're basically part of one nation and, and the Germans clearly have that, or they had that enough that they could achieve that ast astonishing result. Finally, also, they, they're they a very strong manufacturing country. Uh, they're actually the outlier that kind of beguiles everybody else into thinking they can maybe pursue manufacturing-led growth. And really, only the Germans and the and the South Koreans seem to be able to do that. Meanwhile, Northern Ireland, I mean, it's, 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 it's grown a bit, but it used to be the most prosperous part of Ireland. And Southern Ireland was the backwater over the over the 80 years since independence that's been flipped around so we're more likely to try to copy and ask what um what the republic of ireland has been doing over that finally just one point on exemplars where it has really worked uh, midwestern us states in general have shown some good stories there was an excellent economist um long series about these universities and their their reliance on immigrant labor and knowledge industries being connected to the whole world is a really key aspect of this and universities are fundamentally as Rachel said they're globalized institutions and you need that you need demand from the whole world to come into your region if you want it really to boom so those midwestern US um, states with strong universities they're good exemplars to look at okay great thanks um and we tuck a few more questions in um Lauren, Benny, we, thanks for asking about the NHS and, and the role of that. Will you forgive me? I think we covered that and tried to cover that in our Friday session. So I'm not going to say specific health ones in this, but thank you for asking it. Um, let's um, let's uh, go to one from um, Geraint Evans, who says, look, not every community can attract major private sector employers and significant uh, investment. Fundamentally, government's got limited control and visibility of private sector investment and, and choices. Should Whitehall focus more on investment on schemes that it can control, for example, transport in infrastructure, already a subject of dispute in this, uh, that can move communities closer to jobs rather than simply jobs closer to communities? And this goes to one of the key you know, arguments about, about this. Peter. Um, Bronwyn, can I, can I pick that up? Can I take up uh, yep. something that has been troubling yeah. uh, from a previous question, and that is how serious is the government and how seriously committed is the Treasury going to be? This is absolutely uh, at the heart of this, because, you know, when you talk about infrastructure uh, spending, you know, the Treasury is going to have to answer a very basic question, and that is whether it thinks that any infrastructure spending outside of London is good infrastructure spending and if not what are the limits uh, the Treasury will apply when it comes for example to reversing the beaching cuts of 60 years ago uh, uh, for example I mean i.e how the Treasury um, measures and judges value for money uh, and return um, is absolutely uh, central to this. I mean, does it think that a pound spent, for example, on apprenticeships in Hartlepool is in itself more valuable because mm. of the levelling up agenda than a pound spent on apprenticeships uh, in London, where there will be more people chasing those apprenticeships, more apprenticeships being generated, uh, a, li a link to a, a greater number of uh, businesses, and potential growth 
I mean, if, they, if you're going to continue to be skewed in your measurement uh, 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 this way and the value that's created in the return uh, to your spending, then that is going to torpedo your levelling up uh, uh, agenda. And another question is this, does it, is the Treasury going to conclude that revenue spending is as important as capital spending uh, in order to level up? I mean, you know, uh, if so, is Rishi Sunak going to substantially restore um, the uh, local government spending uh, to uh, the Midlands and the north of England, which have been disproportionately impacted uh, by local authority cuts and cuts to services and spending per head of the population during the last uh, decade. I mean, these are very fundamental questions uh, for the Treasury, and the answers to them will determine, in my view, whether what we're talking about is simply a political uh, mm. marketing device on the part of the government, or whether it, that we are actually going to see a serious change in conservatism uh, tantamount to that we saw in Thatcherism. So if Johnsonism, Johnsonism and levelling up is going to be more than a sort of short term ameliorative cosmetic uh, uh, political marketing and, you know, jam spreading, uh, as, I, as I perhaps a little unfairly uh, call it, then the Treasury is going to have to make ask, ask itself some very fundamental questions uh, and is going to have to come up with some very substantial adjustments to the approach it's taken uh, hitherto. Thanks for that. John, do you have um, more thoughts on this? I think as a, as a general principle, the extent to which the government has to get involved um, uh, is on a sort of sliding scale, really, depending on where the place in question is starting from. So we've sort of talked about this a bit earlier on, but, you know, big cities are uh, perfectly capable of being good standalone investments for the right sort of money. And there is plenty of this money around. You know, the UK pension system in aggregate is worth about six trillion pounds. So it doesn't take the shifting of very much of that to make a big difference. What do you do in the smaller places? How do you uh, address, for example, not the big north-south divide, but the north-south divide that exists in Manchester, where the south is much more prosperous than the north? Um, and where do you have to use government money there? And I, I don't personally think... Um, government is, is quite imaginative enough in the way that it uses financing tools to do this. This is the next step, if you like, of the argument beyond the, the one that Peter has articulated about the big questions. So is it possible to use a small amount, for example, of government guarantee here and there to, to leverage in private sector money to make places plausible investments on their own merits? I think it is, but I, I think there needs to be a lot more serious thought, and I hope that happens within the UK Infrastructure Bank and as part of the replacement of EIB spending, which we need to see. OK, thanks for that. We've got a, a lot of, I mean, terrific questions. I'm spoiled for a choice to, for the one to squeeze in right at the end. We've got lots saying, ah, is, is the government simply going to put money on conservative constituencies? I think we have um, we've all uh, discussed that. Um, let me um, go for one. Um, I don't like your last thoughts on things, but also one that Mary Dijewski has just um, sent in saying, you know, is the pandemic perhaps going to do part of the government's job by effectively levelling London down? And um, really ask you to sort of expand on the, the, the question of how the government should treat London, um, which is also obviously affected by Brexit, something we haven't really touched on. And let's, um, it's going to have to be last thoughts in about half a minute each. Um, Giles, let me start with you. I, this is this is not meant to be a sort of a, a chess beating point, but I've lived in London for a long time. I'm very grateful to it for sort of supporting me for that time. It's an absolutely outstanding city on a global scale. We should not be in any way trying to damage it. Thinking that's going to um, I think some of the cases that investment has flown too much there are a little, a, a little iffy when people study harder the the numbers. 
Uh, but the last thing we need to be doing is taking this city that is absolutely spectacular across half a dozen industries and saying, well, we need to take it down a peg, particularly after COVID has, has caused a lot of difficulties. But London is an engine for the whole country and we'd be making a huge mistake to damage it. Thank you. Rachel. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the this agenda needs to be about improving certain places, not downgrading others. And there's no reason why it can't be. Um, and I think it's another danger of this kind of rhetorical levelling up point. I think in terms of whether COVID will do our work for you, just one thing that I think is worth bearing in mind is that there's been a lot of conversation about whether actually a lot of this will happen just because people will work from home more and they'll go to more places and it will all be more distributed. But actually, when you look across the country, um, exactly the kind of places in the Red Wall or elsewhere that people want to improve are the places where people haven't been working from home at all because they're in different industries and doing different jobs which force them to go into their place of work and it's a reminder that the economies and lives of the people in these places is very very different from those in London and certainly for the people on this call. Um, so I don't think you can assume COVID will do your job for you really in any sense. It creates more constraints more than it creates um, opportunities. Since we're on last thoughts, I think I just want to reiterate what I said at the beginning, which is I think that there is tangible progress that with concentration can be made in a relatively small number of years and needs to be made as part of a kind of longer term <laughs> And my fear is that in creating constantly coming back to these staggeringly large challenges, which we should try and address, we, in, we ignore those tangible um, gains and outcomes. And that would be a failure in policy and political terms. Thank you. John. I think the, the worry about the post-COVID recovery is not that it'll be U-shaped or V-shaped or anything else like that, but that it ends up being K-shaped with some people doing extremely well as the economy bounces back, often those who have worked from home and not lost their jobs and others doing very badly on the lower leg of the K. And I think that's true within London and across the country much more broadly. So we do need to worry about inequality uh, at a much smaller, more local scale post COVID than just London versus everywhere else. The, the, the final thought is that this is about leveling up, not leveling down. So we shouldn't be leveling anywhere down. We need to be creating a bigger cake rather than worrying about the distribution of the cake we currently have. Thank you. And Peter, forgive me very briefly. We, we've seen how the experience of the pandemic has exposed and sharpened and deepened inequalities that already exist amongst people in different parts of the country. And the second point I would make is that if we are going to reshape the UK economy, as I believe we need to do post uh, Brexit, it has to be the whole of the economy uh, and not just one half of it. Why, why throw away the other half? Why, yeah. why just use the resources? Why throw away the talents and skills uh, of people? It's not just, you know, uh, inequitous to uh, to think in that way. It's completely wasteful. Uh, that's why we've got to think and approach this uh, from a, from the UK standpoint. Um, uh, 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 and not simply building on what is already ahead uh, and is already advantageous. That's not to do down or to diminish uh, what's already doing well. We've just got to bring up the rest alongside it. Thank you very much. And on that, we're going to have to wrap up. Thank you um, all very much for watching and for some terrific questions. There's lots more that are a fascinating debate in themselves. Thank you above all to the panellists.